So the next uh, presenter is Ana Amargo Azevedo. Ana Camargo Azevedo. Ana believes cultural understanding, reciprocity, and long-term people-to-people -people relationships are the basis for a more equitable international education sector that can positively impact individuals and societies. Ana has over 16 years of experience in building international relationships and collaborations with a strong focus on creating connections between Latin America and Oceania. She is interested in skill transfer, knowledge transfer, language, and cultural idiosyncrasies. Ana represents Education New Zealand, Manopo Kiteau, Education New Zealand, in, uh, the New Zealand Government Agency for International Education for 12 years in Brazil. In New Zealand, she was Education New Zealand Head of Internationalization for four years. Uh, I just want also to acknowledge that Ana is a, one of the founders of LINK. And Ana is with us since the first edition in support. And I would like not only to introduce Ana, but give a very warm welcome for the support you have been uh, uh, providing for LINK on the last five years. Few at home, literally, Ana, welcome. Thank you, Marcos. Those are very kind words. Um, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Ko Ana Zevedo toku ingoa no São Paulo Brasil okutipuna kete no hoki tamaki makoro. Kia ora, good morning everybody. In Aotearoa e boa tarde a todos e a todas no Brasil. Uh, my name is Ana Zevedo, meu nome é Ana Zevedo. I'm from São Paulo Brasil. I live here in Auckland, uh, New Zealand. Um, I'd like to thank you, Marcos, for the very kind words which I do not deserve. Um, and thank you, all the audience, for this amazing opportunity to be here today um, and for joining the session. My presentation today, I will ask if people um, can share for me. Um, I just have to explain, I have this awful, awful flu and coughing. So it may be that in the middle of the presentation, I have to close the camera and the audio. If I start coughing, I try to hold the tone of my voice. So um, can we please just put it in full presentation mode? Thank you. Yeah, just in case, um, if you see me closing the camera and the audio is because I started coughing, but I try to hold my voice so it doesn't happen and you don't have to be part of my flu. So my presentation today is about a topic that's very close to my heart, very important to me, which is internationalization and cultivating global citizenship, reciprocity, people-to-people -people relationships, and cultural acknowledgement for building true internationalization. And again, the experiences um, or the perceptions that I'm going to share are, of course, based on my experience of being born in Brazil, working with internationalization um, for New Zealand government. So dealing with this very different experiences in perspectives within the context of internationalization. Uh, if you can move please to the next slide. So internationalization of education is a um, complex process in constant development um, or change, and that is continued, uh, continuously studied by researchers around the world. Um, what I noticed, depending on where you are, um, an individual, a government agency, or an education provider, is that sometimes this process of internationalization is desired and planned, but sometimes it's almost imposed upon you. Uh, and this difference in the way you experience internationalization will depend also on where you are in the planet. It's affected by your nationality, your previous education experiences, your cultural background, or the language you speak. As an individual participating in, in, on the beginning of the, of the internationalization process, or I should that you may be a desired part of this process or not, depending on your background. And if we look 
in the meaning of the word international, or like just considering the words inter as between or among and nationalist nations. Um, the idea of internationalization is a process between two or more nations, but the, the challenge in internationalization of education is that unfortunately this relationship is not well balanced. Um, so uh, yeah, it's not necessarily an equitable relationship between the parts involved in the process. And in my experience, the first step to make internationalization more equitable is to ensure all participants in the process feel they are contributing to it, contributing to the process in a balanced way and not as a top-down experience. If we can move to the next one, please. And I'm going to spend some time here because globalization, internationalization, global citizenship are three of maybe the key concepts to, to understand the, the, the process of internationalization. So when we think about globalization um, and international education, they, these both concepts or both processes have existed from a very, uh, very early age in history um, of trade or the history of universities, but they become more and more um, intertwined over the past 100 years or maybe since mid last century um, with the influence of post-war technology and increased uh, connectivity. In a summarized way, we can say that the globalization of the economy added pressure to the internationalization of higher education. There was a need to generate professionals better prepared to navigate through different economies and markets. In terms of internationalization of higher education, we have the period between wars when part of the goals of international education included security, soft power, building diplomatic relations. But over the past decades, internationalization has been more and more influenced by more immediate financial outcomes coming from international tuition fees, um, impacting, having a short term impact on the local economy of the countries receiving um, international students, especially, or filling gaps in the job market um, and consequently increased soft power. When we look at countries like US, Germany and UK, they have been involved in international education for 100 years or more in a more structured way um, with the creation of dedicated government agencies in the 30s and 40s to build those relationships. But countries like New Zealand, and if we look around Canada and Australia as well, they can be considered newer to the game um, and probably among the ones perceived globally as having a stronger motivation that's connected to this short-term financial outcomes. Uh, if we think New Zealand, Education New Zealand was created as a government agency for international education in 2011. So it's the, the so yeah, this is, um, of course, international education is part of New Zealand for much longer, but as part of the structure of the government with a dedicated agency is as new as 2011. Um, as a result of economic power and colonization. When we look at the traditional global, move, global movement in the process of internationalization, this has been led by English speaking countries or European countries positioned as those leading educations. When we look in, uh, in the case of Brazil, the first formal um, agreements for international education were with the US in the 50s, um, regions like so US, European countries as those leading the way, uh, regions like Asia and Latin America being seen in many circumstances as student sources and not much more than that. Um, and making it to global citizenship now, global citizenship is one of the expected outcomes of, in of internationalization. Um, it's, it brings hope to um, in the process of internationalization, 
It is embedded in the Sustainable Development Goal 4, ensuring inclusive and quality education for all and promote lifelong learning. And it can be a response to this excessive transactional approach that has been attributed to internationalization. Now, if we can move to the next one, please. So I mentioned the transactional approach to internationalization, and I think it's worth exploring the risks this excessive focus on short-term economic gains can bring to such a critical process as internationalization is. Uh, the strong association between globalization and international education can and have increased global economic gaps and in-country social gaps as well. Um, but if we analyze between Brazil and New Zealand or Latin America and New Zealand, in, in both regions, this has happened. Um, on an individual level, um, the access to international education, the fluency in a second language will, in most cases, increase employability and professional opportunities and consequently like uh, economic life, financial life. Um, in many cases, the access to international education is related to a previous existing economic power or economic access. Uh, it costs money to, to have access to international education. Um, so it perpetuates existing social gaps. On a country level, internationalization of education connects to knowledge economy, international reputation, capacity to attract investments and brands, soft power and global influence. Uh, there is a small number of countries, again, that have benefited from this model for decades, uh, especially those English-speaking countries or European countries. Um, besides economic gaps, this existing old model also brings other risks as the language barrier. Um, again, an influence of globalization and economic power um, on science or knowledge is that, is that the science or knowledge that's not produced in English or not shared in English doesn't have the same visibility or accessibility. Uh, and this is a big risk to the world when we face situations like the ones we face now with climate change, um, impact on biodiversity. Uh, usually the important data in these areas, they are uh, collected or important observations will be done locally on the regions that are initially affected. Um, and, and this data or these observations probably won't be done necessarily in English, so they escape uh, the attention of uh, a, a big part of the world. This is also, um, this existing model is also an education scientific model that promotes a very westernized idea of education and science. It ignores aspects that are very relevant to New Zealand and Brazil or Latin America, like indigenous culture and indigenous epistemology. And the last risk that I'd like to highlight is maybe a positive one, because as there has been a, um, a shift in the way internationalization is perceived and, and um, a growing um, attempt to make it more equitable, uh, countries that remain in this position of um, leaders of international education or remain in this position more colonialist, they may start to be perceived as not being good partners. Um, so uh, yeah, it's something as a as a country from a government perspective and from education providers perspective, it's really important to consider that uh, am I a desirable partner for the world? So if we can move to the next one. So these are just some examples of how we can change the game and build up uh, through internationalization. Uh, developing a new approach to internationalization engage, engagements, prioritizing a more equitable conversation, uh, considering the entire environment of international education, not only the relationships nece necessary to attract international students, 
which unfortunately has been the priority. Uh, there is a need to review even the vocabulary we use. Like uh, we hear so much uh, when discussing international education, talking, referring to countries as markets or a student source, which is even worse. Um, so maybe we should replace these expressions with countries and partners. Uh, there is a need to plan for true long-term relationships and partnerships instead of having this focus on student recruitment or student attraction only. I also need for more a key word uh, that's reciprocity for mutually beneficial relationships based on genuine collaboration. Uh, to achieve these goals, to, to make these changes, it's mandatory to reevaluate the adopted westernized model of internationalization, developing a new model that brings the local culture, the uniqueness of New Zealand and Latin America to the center of this relationship. We need to consider individuals and country goals, uh, the full extension of the outcomes and impact of international education to socioeconomic goals to all, uh, and not only to those individuals directly involved in the process and how we ensure this outcomes and impact are long lasting for future generations. In considering the future, we need to review how we collaborate through education to face global challenges. We need to be intentional in the way we develop internationalization and we need to be less transactional and more transformational. If we can go to the next one, please. I pointed that when discussing international education, we need to extend our engagements in relationships beyond the, the student. And, and in many discussions, the focus rely on, on the student and student mobility and services to international students. But in this next slide, I present a list of all the actors or influences, the entire network or ecosystem of international education. And probably it's broader than what I have there as well, but if we can move to the next slide, please. <laughs> when we talk about building long-term, sustainable and mutually beneficial relationships, uh, these are the potential partners that we can consider. So we have government agencies directly connected to education and international education, but also those connected to research, innovation, employability, economic development. Uh, g relationship is a key, is key as um, we, we can connect international education to any economic set, sector or to any sector of our society. Really. It's about human development. Uh, Maori indigenous nations and indigenous groups, uh, Maori and indigenous education providers, teachers and researchers, universities and other education providers, other teachers and academics as well, ed techs and education publishers, specialized media, specialized in education, uh, international education organizations and professionals in the sector, trade, business, industry sectors and associations, finally students and alumni as well. Uh, the important thing is that all these uh, influences or all these actors, they are interconnected and a true equitable internationalization can only be achieved when we engage with all of them in a reciprocal way. If we can move to the next one, please. Um, so what I'm going to, to present now very quickly uh, and it's closing the, the presentation it's a very specific experience um, when I was part of a project developing the internationalization framework for Education New Zealand Manapo Kitea. Um, and I presented the framework in the next slide, but in the case of the relationship between Brazil and New Zealand, some of the priorities we consider and some of the engagements that we had been progressively uh, built over the past years, over the previous years were uh, fostering the development of a strong people-to-people -people connections. So um, the idea of people-to-people -people connections rather than government-to-government uh, -government or business-to-people, just bring, or business-to-business, -business, but just bring people to the center of the conversation. 
uh, increased focus on supporting Maori and indigenous engagement and collaboration. Use opportunities to identify common areas of interest <coughs> and exchange of good practices. Um, uh, it, it, it's, you have to find the intersection of um, the desire of both and the needs of both parts involved. Um, follow engagement with opportunities for collaboration, create these opportunities and present them to your partners. And present Aotearoa New Zealand as a long-term partner and not as someone who is there or a country or an institution that's there just to recruit international students. So this last one, uh, I'm sorry. We're just waiting a little minute so Anna can go off and hopefully she can come back. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. I'm back. Sorry, I had to save everybody from hearing that. Um, if we can move to the last slide, please. So this is the framework. This is um, the final product from uh, this project. <coughs> The framework is named Kiteau, um, going global. It was named Kiteau by ENZ Manukura or the, um, the ENZ Maori Chief Advisor. And, and the name is so special to us because it is the result of the co-development, the co-development process between uh, the team uh, involved in, in, in the internationalization project with the Rotaki Maori team at the NZ. So um, it, yeah, it was really special to, to have this acknowledgement as part of the, the, the process. One peculiarity of this project that made it um, very special to me is that our team, mm. sorry, our team, uh, besides the, the Rotaki Maori colleagues, included uh, a colleague from the US. It was a very diverse team. So um, we had a colleague from the US and the US is a country where the core of our relationship relies on inclusion of minorities in the internationalization process and supporting Maori and indigenous collaboration. So it, there was a big focus on that as part of this project. A colleague based in India one from New Zealand and me from Brazil. So this group all together um, had such a diversity of views and experiences in the internationalization process. And we were able to bring all these combined views into, the, into this final uh, framework. Um, the framework has in its core uh, Maori values like Aroha, Manakitanga and Kaitiakitanga the care for the people, the care for the land, the care for our partners. And this is what we would like to see as the core of international education in New Zealand when New Zealand um, relates with the world when we approach uh, our international partners around the world. It has three lenses in the external part, um, which is ensuring internationalization will contribute to social and cultural empowerment, um, international reputation and impact, and a focus on the future for the next generations. Important to say that the framework, this lenses and uh, all its target areas, as we call, they are not for New Zealand only, they are for the relationship to be built with our partners. So it's important to, to point out that these are achievements for both sides of the relationship. Um, so we can see social equity and reciprocity as areas that would be addressed in the internationalization relationships. We, <coughs> we also see sustainability innovation, development of long-term global connections and contribution to socioeconomic goals of countries involved in the, in the process. 
Um, as I said, this is a framework to how to guide how ENZ we approach its partners, its global partners, and what will be expected as outcome of internationalization engagements to all those involved. Um, it's a movement to leave behind the tired model of single-sided short-term view view student attraction and um, an attempt to build a more sustainable approach to internationalization. So this is this was my last slide. Apologies for the awful voice and the coffee in the middle of the <laughs> of the presentation. Um, I don't know if there are any questions and comments. If we have time, um, I'm here. Ioana, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm sorry, and I'm so glad that you made. I know how it was a challenge. You just came back from a huge mission with an international group, and even with this cough and this flu, you managed. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your presentation. That was really nice. If you allow me, there's one question for you here. Uh, uh, now we'll read in Portuguese. Ana. Com um cenário geopolítico tão turbulento como o atual, com tantas guerras, intolerância, ataques a imigrantes, você acha que o cenário para o desenvolvimento da educação internacional está mais complicado? Eu acho que... Eu acho que é mais necessário. Quanto mais nós temos conflitos, quanto mais nós temos desigualdades sociais, quanto mais nós temos... Disagreement in governments, the more internationalization is necessary, the more we need to talk and the more we have to consider the people involved in the process and not the governments. Um, yeah, just just put people in the center. 